tonight is our healing and communion service. And so if you have uh, people that you know that are sick and you want a prayer cloth, if, you're, if, you're, if you have something, a handkerchief, you can bring it up now and put it on the platform. We'll pray over it. Um, is those ones that somebody brought? Or those ones that we already had here. Okay. Anybody bring those? Those are the ones we already had up here. Okay. We'll be praying over there after the service. And so um, if you don't have one, we've we got some here we can give you. If you've got people you know that are in need of healing, uh, just like Acts 19 tells us that uh, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul and that aprons and handkerchiefs were taken from his body and laid on the sick folk and they were healed and the demons went out of them and so forth. Hallelujah. Now, your door is welcome to go over to our youth church if you want to. Uh, that's right next door. That's where all the, the, the guys just went and they'd be glad, glad to have you over there. If you, Shannon, would you, you want to, uh, if she wants to go, should you go, go with her or something? Hallelujah. All righty. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the 103rd Psalm. We're going to be talking about healing tonight. <clears throat> you know, um, and of course, this is a good time to talk about it. You know, sometimes people get, in winter, we get pit, people get hit with stuff, and, you know, um, they got all kinds of flu. I like David Engel's old song, I've Never Heard of the Heavenly Flu. <laughs> heard about Asian, heard about swine, heard about Hong Kong, but they're not mine. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Never heard of the Heavenly Flu, have you? Have you? Thank you, Cap. You're, he's just jumped right in there. 103rd Psalm, verses 1 through 4 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Well, we, we know about this first one. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. I'm telling you, brother, I'm, I know people will just jump off on that one. I was watching a, a Christian television program one night, and a well-known evangelist um, was on there. And, and, boy, he got a hold of this. He took off. He preached like a house of fire. How about how Jesus forgives all your iniquities? It doesn't matter what you've done. You could be a prostitute. You could be a murderer. It doesn't matter. Jesus will forgive you and restore you and forgive all your iniquities. And boy, the phone banks lit up. People were getting saved. I don't know if they're in bars or wherever, but they, they saw that. They heard the good news that God will forgive them no matter where they are. And they started calling and calling and calling. And after a while, you know, that kind of dies down, those, those kind of live television programs. And then he goes, now the next part of that verse, brother, to, talking to the host, goes, who healeth all thy diseases. And he went, now you know always, he says, healeth all your diseases. That don't always mean all. Now, how could it mean all your iniquities on the first part and not mean all your diseases on the second part? I mean, I, I just sat there and went, you just undid your whole sermon. Because either all means all or all don't mean all. In the context of this here, <clears throat> he's saying God will forgive all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Why? Well, you know, if we get into it, we may or may not actually hit this in... in, in, in um, and point making but you know jesus bore our sin and jesus bore our sickness in the same sacrifice at the same time yes. when he went to the cross amen. amen so same sacrifice amen different arenas of our life it's ministering to you know him becoming sin for us who knew no sin deals with the spiritual nature of man and him taking our sickness deals with ailments in our physical bodies yes. God cares about your body. Amen. God's concerned about what happens with your physical body. Can you say amen? amen. Um, forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. We can, we, but we get off on these things where we get this, this pre-prescribed mental or, or theological thing we've been taught that God doesn't always heal. And then we run off and go, well, you know, Jesus doesn't always heal. Well, how do you know that? Well, you know, well, my church manual has, says so. My church handbook says so. Well, your church handbook ain't the gospel. Now, I grew up in a Pentecostal denomination, and we would, all, we would say something like this. We would say, you know, I believe in divine healing as in the atonement. Did you know atonement's not a New Testament word? Well, it's in the King James. It's not, it's not right. It should be, it's Paschal. It should be, you know, it's, it's not the right word for atonement. Jesus is not our atonement. He's our Passover. He's our Paschal Lamb. He, we were not atoned for. We were redeemed. Everyone say, I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. I wasn't atoned for. See, atonement was an Old Testament covering in anticipation of the New Testament redemption or purchasing back. Amen. Under the Old Testament, they could only get covered for one year. They had to come back next year and do it all over again. 
and they get them all covered again, and they come back next year and do it all over again. But now once he's entered in with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, in other words, you don't have to keep coming back. That redemption is settled forever, and as long as you walk in the light of it, you, you can partake of it. But it's an eternal redemption. It's not you come back every year and like, well, you know what? This is 2014. I have to come back and make sure that all my sins from 1983 are covered. That's not true. No, his blood has taken it. It's a redemption. It's not an atoning. All right? <clears throat> but my church handbook said we believe in divine healing as in the atonement. And we know this is one of those words you kind of go, well, it's, it's, it's just not accurate. Your manual, so your church manual, if it says God doesn't heal, it's not right. Yeah. You know, you have preachers stand and say, well, healing passed away the day the last apostle died. Who said all the, all the apostles are dead? Yeah. Where does it say in the Bible there are no more apostles? Yeah. He actually said, he gave some prophets, apostles, I mean, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, or evangelists, pastors, and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. I want to ask you something. Are all the saints perfected? Nope. So we still have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They were given. He gave some gifts, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. The saints hadn't been perfected. So we still got them. That goes over real good. Well, we only believe in pastors and evangelists. Well, you, you need to change your believing. Your believing's wrong. All right. So, and then John, third John, the second verse, you, know, you, you understand this, some of these letters we, we don't have, they'll reference them in some, some references as first, third John 1, 2. There's only one chapter, there's only, so there's no multiple chapters. So you can say third John 2 or third John 1, 2. It, 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 either one would be correct as far as referencing. But he says, beloved, I pray above. Now, now, now King James says, I wish. It's really pray. Above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Even as thy soul prosperous. So God wants us to prosper physically. He wants us to prosper financially. But he wants it in relationship to how our soul is prospering. How does your soul prosper? By renewing it to the word of God. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus bore our sickness at the same time he bore our sin. Um, it's amazing. I, I just get amazed. You'll quote 1 Peter 2.24 to people. Who his own self bear our sin and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. And they'll go, that was spiritual healing. Really? Now he was quoting Isaiah 53. Now we're over to Isaiah 53. Okay? Really? That was talking about spiritual healing. You know, somebody get real, they'll get real cute where they go. They're talking about the spiritual disease of sin. Is that right? Well, let's, let's, look at, let's look at Isaiah first. Then we're going to run somewhere else and just totally disprove that. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. Um, I, I need to get over there in my Bible because I've got some notes in my Bible that I don't have in my notes. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. All right. I wrote some things in my Bible that, that I don't have written over here. All right. Here we go. Isaiah 53, 3. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him, and we did despise him and esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are Healed. Now, obviously, Peter's quoting from here. Yeah. Amen? When he says, by his stripes we were healed, uh, you know, Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes we are healed prophetically. Jesus, I mean, Peter says, by his stripes we were healed in uh, confirming or affirming that it has taken place. Yeah. Amen? It's no longer prophetic. It's been, it's been satisfied. <clears throat> but let's look at something here. Now, the King James Bible now, how many know the King James translation was took place around 1611? And even now, we don't have the 1611 version that we use. Now, there are some people who wear baseball caps, 1611 KJV. Man, the only Bible they'll use is a 1611 KJV. They told Brother Hagin, one lady came to Brother Hagin one time. He says, now, the Greek said this, or the Greek said that. She came up to him and said, I want you to know if the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. 
And you just can't fix stupid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You just can't, you can't fix that. <clears throat> um, Greek was what it was written in. The, the, the Queen's language only came around, you know, 1,000, 1,300 years later. Hello? And even the language they used in 1611, we don't even use it. It's, the, the King James now we've, has had some, some and not, not the new King James, just the King James has had tweaks and changes because the language is so archaic, we can't even, we, it wouldn't even make sense to us. How many of you have ever tried to read Wycliffe's Bible? You know, Y is for eyes, and, you know, and it's more phonetically um, sounding, spelled than it is the way we spell our English. Um, so understand that. But words... Um, words evolve over time, and they take changes, and they, take, they change meaning. How many have ever, ever heard the charity, word charity? Now, you go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and they translated the word agape. They translated it charity, because at the time of the writing of the King James, for a, um, a lord... You know, how many know England's divided up in their, 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 um, their legislature is divided up in the House of Lords and the House of Commons? The Lords are those who are titled. They're Lords. They have a right to their seat. The commoners have the House of Commons. I hate the monarchy system. You know, just, just this whole, we're better than you, you peons, and all this kind of stuff. But in the era, for someone of the, of, of the uh, royalty and of the bloodline of you know, royalty or, you know, dukes and, you know, lords and all these different titles they had for, for those who basically just won a battle somewhere and decided, decided they were royal. You know, that's how it worked. They declared, you know, I'm a monarchy. You know, they didn't have a monarchy in the Middle East until they got a bunch of oil, got rich, and all of a sudden they declared themselves monarchies. <laughs> you know, we're rich, we're monarchy, we're royal. The royal family of, of, of uh, Saudi Arabia. Well, they weren't royal before. Just found some oil. Got rich. But when, when they would do something for the peons, it was considered a great thing. They did it because they didn't have to. They didn't have to. They didn't have to do anything for the peons. And so the, to use the word charity to translate agape at that time meant something. It carried more meaning. Now you think, United Way came by and I gave him 20 bucks. It doesn't have the same meaning. Okay? And so there are times words that change or whatever. So let's, let's take these words here in this chapter. We're not rewriting the Bible. We're going back to the Greek or the Hebrew, actually, and, and getting the definitions as they should be translated in our language so we understand it the way that it was intended to be understood. Not rewriting the Bible. We're just, we're just getting, going back and getting words to match the, the Hebrew word that convey what the Hebrew is trying to convey in today's language. Okay? It may have meant something more 400 years ago. It doesn't mean that anymore. It doesn't carry the same import. All right? So, first of all, the word sorrows here comes from the Hebrew makab, M-A-K-O-B. Now, these are transliterate. You understand an M is not in Hebrew. They got these weird letters. Okay? And they do, we do what we call transliterations. We assign an a, a Aramaic letter that compares to, and we have, a, I think it's Aramaic um, or, um, lettering system, you know, we don't have a Greek lettering system. The Russians do. We don't. How many times have you seen a name with a three, three in there? And we don't have it. All right? So, you know, whatever the Hebrew letter is, 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 is parallel to the M and the A and that kind of stuff. So the Hebrew word mechaba, and it means um, grief or pain. Sorrow actually is its last translation. All right? So he, he, he was a man of despised and rejected men, a man of pain. Well, I'll tell you, the cross was a painful thing. They plucked his beard. They beat him with rods. They, they put the crown of thorns in him. I mean, uh, how, many ever saw, how many ever saw the passion of Christ, the passion of the Christ? You know that um, uh, Mel Gibson did. Yeah, thank you. You know, you know, they put on him real thick leather so they could beat him with those things. And they still, some of it wrapped around and cut him from underneath. I mean, he, he, did, get, he did get injured filming that. Um, the Roman scourge was not your cowboy whip. Pow! I mean, that would hurt, but it wasn't what he got. They would tell those about this long, about this wide. They would put uh, bone and rock and um, uh, clay, you know, clay pots where they broke it. You know, for anything that would cut and tear. Usually administered by three different people at the same time, each given 39 lashes. Remember, 40, 40 saved one. Jesus' back was just completely opened up. 
There, there was no, it was just shredded. Okay? He was acquainted with he, he went through pain for us. Amen? And we hid as that were our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Now, grease comes from the word coily. C-H-O-I-L-Y. Again, a transliteral um, rendering of the, of the Hebrew word. And it meant disease, pain, sickness. I mean, pain, disease, grief, sicknesses. And, and the, now, this is strong. Now, in the Brown Driver and Biggs, uh, Briggs uh, Concordance, it's simply sickness. This word means sickness. So the word translated grief is surely hath borne our sicknesses, carried our pains, and we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes or bruise we are healed. Now, it's not, uh, listen, people read that and go, oh, that's spiritual. Well, let's go to Matthew 8. Matthew, the 8th chapter. Now, Isaiah prophesies that with his stripes we are healed. Peter confirms the fulfillment of prophecy by saying by his stripes we were healed. But theologians and, and people who don't study the Bible say it was spiritual. But Jesus did take our spiritual sin. He carried our sin to his cross. He took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, Colossians says, and nailed it, taking it away, and nailed it to his cross, glory to God. Amen. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Glory to God. <clears throat> now, Matthew 8, verse uh, 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick. Oh, Peter had a mom-in-law. Guess what Peter had? He had a wife. Amen. Now, he may have been singing, mother-in-law, but he had a wife. I know because a lot of people say, well, you know, Peter is the first this or whatever. And, you know, and you know, no priest can have wives. Well, Peter did. He had him a wife. Come on, when it came to mother-in-law. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, wife laid and sick of a fever. He touched her hand. The fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. Now, when evening was come, that means the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Now, I heard somebody say one time, they don't believe in devils. Well, Jesus did. Hello? And he cast out the spirits with his word, listen to this, and healed all that were what? Didn't say he forgave all that were sinful. He said he healed all that were sick. Now, is that what it says? Can y'all read that? Everybody see that? If you, don't, if you don't have a Bible open, what does it say here? He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. So a bunch of folks showed up, and Jesus went out there and cast out the devils, healed all that were sick. Listen to verse 17 that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now, that is Greek for Isaiah. That is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Isaiah. Okay? Isaiah, the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Where did they find that? Isaiah 53, 5, 3, 4, and 5. Now, he said when he healed the sick, physically sick, it was a fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah, a prophecy that Peter quotes and says it is an accomplished prophecy. So Jesus physically healed people. Peter says that he's carried our sicknesses, and he's not talking about the spiritual sickness of sin. There is, there is a, um, there is not a cure, but there is an answer to sin. What's it called? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, I mean, you know, listen, I know you, you've got to know that there's churches who are taking the blood out of their hymnals. They don't talk about the blood because they say it makes us a heathenistic religion. But I am telling you, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up Pentecostal. We used to plead the blood. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, what do we mean? We would, we would cover our situation in the blood of Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. Some of them didn't know what they were just doing. They just did what Grandma did. But I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus is powerful. Yeah. Amen. It washes us clean, glory to God. It keeps us clean, hallelujah. It sustains us, praise God. <clears throat> Amen. But the sin, the sin problem has its answer in the blood. The physical problem, the elements in the body, have their answer in the body of the Lord. Now, let's, let's just stop here. I'm, I'm, I may stay with or not stay with my notes. Highly likely I won't. That's just my pattern of life. 
when, when we receive the Lord's table, there are, there are symbolisms there that parallel this very thing. Amen? Now, Jesus said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. How, you know, how many know most, if you go to most churches, they're using um, unleavened bread, crackers. Okay? Why? Because that's what the Jews, they use unleavened bread for their, their, their feasts and their Passovers. They, they, the yeast, the yeast was a bacteria, and they couldn't have it in the bread because it made it impure, so they had unleavened bread. Well, the only way to cook unleavened bread or crackers, how many of you ever noticed your cracker packages? They got what? Holes all in them. Yeah. Why? Because the only way to cook it and get it to cook is to pierce it. And the Bible talks about, um, in, in the uh, 22nd Psalm, they looked on him in whom they pierced. That prophecy was written, that psalm was written 1,500 years before Roman, the Romans used the execution form of crucifixion. They looked on him whom they pierced. When you cook unleavened bread, it doesn't cook even. Now, you get your nice loaf of bread, you can get with leaven, and, you, and it's got yeast in it, it rises. It'll cook a nice golden brown evenly all over the whole thing. Crackers don't. Crackers have stripes on them, basically. They have a darker... Uh, darker brown and then the golden brown, dark brown. You just look at your package of crackers. There they are. It's lighter and darker, lighter and darker, lighter and darker. Why? Because by his stripes we were healed. The communion table, the, the bread represents, Jesus said this when he did it. He break it, said, take it, this is my body. This represents my body. And in that, by his stripes, we were healed. His body was broken. His body was done. All of our sickness was laid on him. By his stripes, we were healed. Now, let me say this. How many know your Bible enough to know that when Jesus died on the cross, there was a, a period of darkness for the space of three hours on the earth? They couldn't look at him. If you go back to Isaiah 52... And you read from Isaiah 52 around verse 14 down through Isaiah 53, 5. It talks about his visage is marred more than any man's. So, and actually, if you study, get this in some different Bibles, you'll see it. It says he didn't even resemble a man when he became sin for us and he took our sickness. Can you imagine every disease ever known to man on Jesus, at one, on one human body at one time? <coughs> I mean, gorders and tumors and, and, and um, boils and all kinds of, you know, diseases all in his body at one time. Carried them all. At the same time, he was carrying sin. Have you ever seen somebody that's been lived a sinful life? I was watching an ABC special a number of years, oh, probably 10 years ago. And they were interviewing this, this drug addict prostitute on the streets. Now, we're not, I'm not condemning her. We love, we want to help people like that. You know, the, the gospel is the only thing that's going to set them free. But they were talking to her, and I'm thinking, my goodness. What is a 50 or 60-year-old woman out there doing turning tricks? And in the interview, it came out, she's 27. She looked every bit of 60. Why? Sin. Sin just ages you. Sin has, has results in your body. And, and you'll see people who live, you know, uh, we, we kind of had this old saying. I don't know if you use it, where, but we use it. You know, they've been road hard and put up wet. You know, kind of a, a kind of a. Uh, you know, talking about the horse, you know, talking about your horse. That horse has been rode hard and put up wet. You see people, their life, they, their life's been rode hard and put up wet. They, they look worn out. They look tattered. And they may not even be sick. It's just living that rough life. Yeah. And then the, the sin affects their body. So imagine Jesus with all the sin on him and then all the diseases on him at one time. God had to make the earth dark. They could not handle the vision of what they would have seen. They would not have been able to uh, mentally handle what they saw so he, he was this visage was marred more than any man he, to the point he didn't even resemble a man i believe that's, that's i think it starts in isaiah 52 13 or 14 hallelujah yeah verse 14 verse 13 says behold my servant shall deal prudently he shall be extolled, exalted and extolled and be very high as many were astonished at him his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Okay? And then it moves on down to the last verse, and then it goes into chapter 15, 53. Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin. He also became sickness for us that we might be delivered from sickness. He carried in his body not only our sin, 
He carried in his body our sicknesses. Now, back to the communion table. And so we have, we have the, the type of his body being broken for our sin. See, there's healing in the communion table. Did you know that? Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance of what? We know it's, it's, not a, it's not a memorial meal in that sense. We just want to remember the Lord. No, it is a remembrance of what this means in the covenant of God towards mankind that his body was broken for us and that healing belongs to us through a covenant with God. Then he said he took the cup. Now, um, we use here clear grape. We used to use red grape juice. You know, a couple kids on that, on that, on the carpet, that just, that'll kind of get, get old. Amen. You know, uh, but see, white grape juice, see, remember, if, you, if you'll go back and study your Bible, when Jesus was, the sword put into his side, water came out and then blood. Now, that was what they saw. They didn't understand that white corpuscles and red corpuscles separated death. In the particular case, Jesus died of a broken heart. His heart ruptured. And there's a sack around your heart. I, I don't think, I think they may uh, generically refer to it as the heart sack, where when his heart ruptured, the blood ran into it and settled. And over, over, you know, the period of time that he was there, the white corpuscles and the red corpuscles separated. And when they put the spear into him, that, that clear serum of the blood, which is the white corpuscles, came out first. And then the thicker, darker corpuscles, the red, came out afterwards. Okay. Um, we had a neighbor a number of years ago pass away, had a heart attack in his, his, um, in his um, kitchen. And, uh, of course, the rescue squad shows up. And when the wife comes home from work, he's laying there. And we went over to, you know, to help any way we could, you know, help. Well, you know, it's not, not, you know, not a lot you can do except help minister to her in the situation. But his body was darker colored on the lower half that was laid down. And the other part of the body was lighter. Now, his blood didn't go anywhere, you know. It's just a separation begins to take place. Because your body's not mixing and stirring and putting oxygen in throughout that time. And so Jesus, went, so, so if we use clear grape juice, don't get up tight, it still represents the blood. Okay? Because it's part of, you know, amen, hallelujah. But Jesus said, he said, this, is, this cup is a New Testament in my blood for the remission of sin. Amen. So we have here at the communion table a declaration by the Son of God that his sacrifice is going to take care of sin and it's going to take care of sickness. Why is everybody healed? Why isn't everybody saved? Because they don't receive it by faith. You have to receive the we have to receive his actions by faith and walk in the light of them. Now there's a lot of people who accept the blood of Jesus for their forgiveness. They don't accept the body of Jesus for their healing. For whatever reason. They've been taught, healing's passed away, healing died, you know. Listen, you know, how can healing pass away when the Lord instituted it and put it into our communion table? It's, the, it's part of our communion table. Healing is part of the communion. The, the psalmist said he forgives all our iniquities, heals all our diseases. Peter said we were made righteous and healed. All what? At the same time. By the same sacrifice. Glory to God. So it belongs to this whole church age. Amen. Because... You, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, let me say, God will dwell in someone that's sick. But, you know, it would be a whole lot better for God to dwell in the body that's well. Well, if he's going, he's going to heal who he's going to heal, well, then you just go ahead and say he's going to save who he's going to save. And that's just, that's just um, you know, I know the people who believe that too, you know. Well, if they're going to get saved, it's because God decided they're going, he's going to save them. You know, I heard one preacher say local one time, I'm using on television. He said, well, come on down here today. It might be your day. Did he not read? Today is a day of salvation. If any will hear his, heart, hear his voice and harden not his heart. Today is a day. Every day is your day. You're waiting on God. He's waiting on you. You're waiting on God to do something he's already done. Think about it. He's already done it. Jesus is not going back to the cross. Jesus is not taking your sickness again. Jesus is not bearing your sin again. It's already done. Well, only God, God's only going to save certain folks. 
Well, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. God's not willing that any should perish. But then he turns right around and tells us that the death and hell is going to give up the dead and they're, and they're, going, to, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Even though he wasn't willing they would, they will. God's not willing that any be sick. He sent Jesus to bear our sicknesses. But there are people who are sick. And we get cute at funerals. They died, but they, they had the ultimate healing. They're in heaven. Well, you're going to get real accurate. They don't even have their body. Read your Bible. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and reign be changed the moment twinkling of an eye. And this corruption put on incorruption. And so and we'll meet them. And so shall we ever meet them in the sky. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. They don't have their body. Not their physical body. Not their resurrected glorified body. Well, that went over big. It's hard to talk about these things without hitting people's theological um, objections to truth and church traditions that rob people of faith. You know the Episcopal Church in America, um, or actually the Anglican Church in England, I'm sorry, the Anglican Church, which is the relative of the Episcopal Church. Now, the Anglican Church is the higher church. In other words, the American Church is part of the Anglican Communion in England. And they're on the, they, they've, been, they've come pretty close the past few years to being dismissed. And I still think it's being discussed because of the exception of homosexual priests. Many American churches left the English, the, the American Episcopal Church, and joined the African communion because they were very strict about, you know, um, living right. You can't have homosexual priests. So uh, there's a lot of churches in America that left the Episcopal, and that's how they refer to it, the Episcopal communion, and left it because it was part of the Anglican communion that permitted them to keep going and went to the African communion and, and because their, their bishops and their priests were saying, no, we're going to live this way. We're going to live according to the word. Amen. Now, churches in Africa are not like churches in other places. They're on fire. There's a move of God going on in Africa. I mean, you talk about, everybody keeps talking about the 1030, 1040 window and then going to Africa. I'm telling you, Africa could come here. There's, there's one church in Africa that, they, that uh, when Pastor Hagen not, not Dad Hagen, but Pastor Hagen went uh, about three or four years ago to preach over there, that they, they estimate. Now, here, here, here's the official estimation. Somewhere between, around a million to a million and a half people were at the service. And that's because they have a half mile wide and a, mi no, a mile wide and a half mile deep set of roofs put together that people punt, pile in under. The unofficial estimation, because they can't, they, see, they won't, they won't broadcast the unofficial because you don't want to hear people complain, oh, you're stretching stuff. But I talked to um, the guy who, who set the thing up. He said, now, unofficially, we believe somewhere closer to two and a half to three million people in that meeting. And you think Joel Osteen's got a big church. Are you hear what I'm saying? Loving God. And, 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 and then they went the next day and preached at a church on Sunday service, and they had... Uh, 50,000 people per service, four services on Sunday morning. They move them out in 15 minutes, 50,000 people. That's hunger for God. We drive up, and if we're going to sit, you know, three seats close to somebody, we leave. If we have to park, you know, uh, seven parking lot spaces down, we leave. Or if the building's too hot, the building's too cold. Well, I'm going to go find me a church that's got the right kind of air conditioning. I'm telling you, there's a, there's, a, there's a move of God in Africa. There's a move of God in other parts. Brazil is having a move of God that just will astound you. God's moving on the earth, and, you know, and America's becoming uh, less moved. Now, we're going to have to do something about that. Amen? Amen? And what's, how, how are we going to do that? We're gonna get, we have to get a passion for the things of God. We've got to stop playing Mickey Mouse and get serious about the things of God. And have moves of God. And I'm not, when I say moves of God, I'm not talking about, you know, we're just going to have moves of God. I'm talking about making an atmosphere where the Spirit of God can manifest and demonstrate himself in line with his word that will minister life to people and set people free. We got people who fight healing just because it goes against their church doctrine and what grandma taught them. And they'll fight it to the end and let people die sick just so they can hold on to their doctrine. Jesus said, you made the word of God of none effect through the traditions of men. We have a tradition that all the miracles passed away the day the last apostle died. That's a tradition of men. There's no scriptures to substantiate or support that. 
Well, all the miracles passed away when we got the canonicity of Scripture. There's no Scripture to support your position. I know Bible schools that forbid speaking in tongues. Really? Did you know the Bible says forbid no man to speak with tongues? Now, you don't have a Scripture that says that it passed away. You, you misinterpret 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when that which is perfect has come. And you say, well, that was a canonicity of Scripture. Really? Are you sure? Can you give me some more evidence other than one scripture that you've misinterpreted to substantiate or support your position? Now, I've got one that says you can't do it. You can't forbid them. you got one that says you can. My scripture trumps your opinion. And so when we come here, but when we come to subjects like healing, people have been taught, well, you know, the Lord, the Lord knows what he's doing. We, we pray prayers. So full of unbelief. And that's where I was going, I was going to the Anglicans. And so the Anglicans, uh, back in about 40, late 40s, early 50s, <clears throat> because of all the, I think it was in the 50s, because of the healing revival in America was, was going crazy. I mean, 40, from 1947 to 1958. Lord spoke to Brother Hagin and said, at the end of World War II, there will come a healing revival that is spread across the nation. And at one time, Brother Gordon Lindsay's magazine, Christ for the Nations, uh, had uh, advertised for 60 traveling healing ministers. They were, they, were, they were ministering and taking care of six, and, and advertising for 60 different ministries. And they were, the only one that didn't advertise was Brother Roberts. He had his own magazine. Okay, and he was, he was the, the biggest or the forefront at the time. You know, Brother Roberts on television and, and so forth. So he had his own magazine. And that last, so, so the Episcopal Church, or not, actually the Anglican Church came and did a study. They did a three-year study on the phenomenon of divine healing. After three years, they came back, and this was their report. We can no longer use the faith-destroying phrase, if it be thy will, in relationship to laying hands on the sick to be healed. They call it the faith-destroying phrase. A three-year study. Now, these are, theolo these, are, these are not little young whippersnappers coming out and going, you know, you heard three people preaching, now you're a minister. These are theologians. I mean, deeply studying and knows, knows the languages of, the, of, you know, Greek, and they know Hebrew and Chaldean. They know the archaeological evidence. And they went out and did a three-year study and came back and said, we can't say if it be thy will. How many of you have ever heard, Lord, if it be your will, heal our dear sister? Yeah. Well, let me tell you what you're in. You're in unbelief. You cannot be in faith until you know what God's will is. You have to know the will of God in order to be able to receive from God. See, if you tell people, well... Lord, save this dear man if it's your will. Well, see, you don't know your Bible. God's not willing that any should perish. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see? He has no faith if you're praying, if it be, Lord, if it be your will, save him. Lord, save me if it's your will. You're not in faith. Amen? You've got to come in faith. And it comes to healing, it's the same thing. We have to know it's God's will. <laughs> we have to know that God wants to, that God's made provision for, and God's made, you know, let's, listen, you know, I, I said this before, the grace of God is the provision for what we need. The faith that we have in our hearts is how we receive it. It will not come on you unless you receive it. Unless you act on it. Okay? All right. Uh, wow. Wow. Well, time got to get away from me in a hurry, doesn't it? Praise the Lord. I got, I got six pages of notes, and I'm halfway through the first page. Anybody sitting in a window? All right. Remember Paul was long in preaching? The guy fell out. He had to go raise him from the dead. Hallelujah. So we're not going to cover all six pages, all right? <clears throat> now, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Matthew 8, 17 says that, when he healed the sick, physical sick, he, he fulfilled prophecy, Isaiah, Isaiah, he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Anybody ever read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through the end of the chapter? What's it say about every verse? Cursed. 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 What's Deuteronomy? It's one of the five books of the... Thank you. 
curse. He says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For us written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus died the crucifixion, and he bore the curse. If you go read Deuteronomy 28, you, and finally down there at the end, he, I, I, I think that, you know, maybe Moses just got tired of things. He just finally said, everything in here and everything that hadn't been written in here yet, it's covered. It's part of the curse. Diseases you got now, and some that's coming later. AIDS is covered. You know, Ebola is covered. Yeah, swine flu, pig flu, Spanish flu, you know, H1N1 flu. Is it H3? Oh, they got a new one, HN. Okay. You know, <clears throat> they're all covered. Under what? The curse of the law. But Christ was made a curse for us. He's redeemed us from that. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Amen. So, you know, all the sicknesses and all the, well, you know, uh, I sinned last week. Repent! It's the simplest thing in the world to do. If you, if you sin, repent. My goodness. Well, you know, I, I don't feel worthy. You can't go by your feelings. Tell your wife tomorrow morning when you wake up, I don't feel married, and see what happens to you. After you wake up from the frying pan experience, you should probably have the marriage license out. We is married. Are you here? <laughs> Slap your side of the head with a, now, a cast iron. Not, not, not these new, newfangled, you know, silver stone. I'm talking about the old-fashioned country ones, the cast iron ones. I mean, you, you dent one of them, and, and, and you got titanium for a forehead. Amen. You don't, you don't, I don't feel married. It doesn't matter if you feel married or not. You're in a covenant with her. Your feelings are irrelevant to the fact that you're married. Your feelings are irrelevant. If you've asked God to forgive you, your feelings are irre irrelevant to the fact you're forgiven and washed. Amen. And so you may feel one way, but the fact of the matter is you're not. Because the devil comes to you and says, well, you know, healing's right, but you know you did this and, and you committed the unpardonable sin. I mean, listen, we've had all kinds of stuff taught to the church. You committed the unpardonable sin. Yes, healing's right now. If you hadn't committed that unpardonable sin, you could get healed. Really? Y'all know what unpardonable sin is? It's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now, two sides to that. One is knowing, uh, knowingly attributing works of God or the Holy Spirit to the devil. That is blasphemous. And, and, and I, quite frankly, am not sure that a sinner could do that because they wouldn't know. They don't know the Holy Ghost. If he walked in with a white pair of pants, white shoes, Kelly green coat, and a pink hat with a feather in it, they wouldn't recognize the Holy Ghost. All right? I don't think baby Christians can. I think it would be after, to blaspheme the Holy Ghost in that sense would have to be a seasoned person in the Lord and, and just knowingly attribute something to the Holy Ghost. A number of years ago, um, when Dad Hagen was traveling, uh, he, he went to a church, and the, 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 pastor, the pastor wouldn't come to any of his, his services on, on, his, on his faith seminar. He came to the night service, but they, Dad would teach on faith during the day, and he wouldn't come to him. So after a few weeks, finally, you know, because you know, he would go sometimes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one time nine weeks at the same church. Every day except, sun, except Saturday. We can't get people out for four nights sometimes. They go nine weeks. And I'm not going to have a nine-week meeting just to have a nine-week meeting, but my goodness. We got, we got to learn to have a little commitment somewhere. But I'll just leave that one alone. So... And in those days, a lot of times they would just stay in the house of the minister. And so one morning at breakfast, the wife cooked breakfast, and she said, Brother, hey, you've got to get my, my husband to come to these morning services. They'll help him. He said, well, I've talked to him two or three times already, and he always has an excuse. He's busy doing this. He's, he's got to be at the radio station. He's got to visit this. He's got to do that. I always made up some excuse so he couldn't be there. And so he said, but I'll talk to him again. So he came in just a couple minutes later, and they sat down and started eating. And, and Brother Hagin started talking about coming to the services. And, and he, he, he started making up excuses. And finally, he just got frustrated and said, don't you know you're going to die? And the man looked up at him and said, yep. 
He said, but if I come to the service, I have to admit I'm wrong and you're right, and I'd rather die than do that. Now, you're talking about stupid on steroids. And um, he closed the meeting down. He said, I can't preach for somebody like that. Went to the next church. He always have churches. He tells churches, when I finish with this, I'm coming to you. So they had to be kind of on, on the fly. You know, I'm closing, on, I'm closing Sunday. I'm going to be with you next Sunday. They, that's how he did things. And they, they all, because they wanted him, they would do that. And so he called the next church, went there. He got there and he said, I, that pastor's going to fall dead in his pulpit two weeks from Sunday. And he did. But when God didn't do it, he was stupid. The Lord tried to help him. I'd rather, I'd rather die than admit I'm right and you're wrong. I mean, I'm wrong and you're right. It cost him his life. It cost him his ministry. It cost him his life. You know? So, so how could somebody be so stupid as they, they would blast you in the Holy Ghost? Well, there, there's, there's an example of how stupid you can get. In life, I had I have a, someone that I would one time I led them to the Lord. They came to our church in, down in Greenville, North Carolina, and uh, I mean, got filled with the Holy Ghost, turned on to the Lord. You couldn't keep them out of church. I mean, we I mean Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Back in those days, we had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday and Friday. So we think, my God, and we had our worship services were an hour and a half. Yeah, you remember that. Did you ever go down there? No. For those days. Yeah. And we could not close a worship service without doing uh, He is Jehovah about 35 times. <laughs> he is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. I mean, we had to, and we had to dance. I mean, we, we just, he was sweating. I mean, I mean, just. Then pastor would preach an hour and a half. She was in every one of the services. Guest speakers, every one of them. Early, left late. But in the past couple of years, I've seen blogs on the internet where they wrote and said, mock the blood of Jesus. Look at their husband and say, I spit in the face of your God. I spit in the face of your God. I'm talking about a girl, born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, flowed in the gifts of the Spirit, sat under good word for years, and now mocks the blood of Jesus and spits in the face of our God. That's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. How shall he who's trodden underfoot the blood of the Son of God, amen, and counted the blood of the covenant where they were sanctified an unholy thing, there remaineth no more repentance for them. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now let me say that. And then the other, other, other way is you die as a sinner without accepting Jesus when he wooed your heart. You, you blaspheme him by refusing to accept. Now, now, as long as you're alive and he's striving with you, but when, 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 he, he, when you die and you've rejected that, you've blasphemed him. Because by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, ain't nobody in this room qualifies for that. So let me say, when the devil comes and says you've committed the unpardonable sin, we don't, we don't call it blasphemy, we call it the unpardonable sin. Some folks don't even know what it is. Just the devil told them and they about, I've committed the unpardonable sin. And they'll start saying, I can't get anything from God. Why? Because I committed the unpardonable sin. No! The very fact that you're still tender toward God tells me you haven't. If you had, you wouldn't be tender toward God. You'd be walking around saying, I spit in the face of your God. You mock the blood of Jesus. Now, with that being said, if you sin, repent. Boop, it's gone. Now come with God. Get what you need from him. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need. He didn't say come sheepishly. He didn't say come cow down. He didn't say come groveling. He said come boldly to his throne. And he'll minister to you. Amen. You'll, find, you'll obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. <coughs> so sickness, and I'm not going to finish. I'm, we're just, I, I could just go on for hours right now. I want to, but I can't. And we, I could keep you here till 3 o'clock in the morning right now. Because I'm on a roll. Hallelujah. Ha! Somebody's going to make me shout. Let's go to hooping and praise God. Glory. 
Janice, don't, don't be shaking your head. Put the hanky away. <laughs> I sat at the church one night, and this little old lady on, the, on about the second row, she got down a little Washington. She got her hanky out. And she, how, how many know where little Washington is? You know where it is, all right? See, if you're from Eastern Carolina, Washington, North Carolina is not Washington, North Carolina. It's little Washington because Washington, D.C. is big Washington. That's how we, that, that's what, you, you'll say, where are you from, little Washington? That's what they'll say. And they've been, they've been in Eastern Carolina their whole life. They just want everybody to know, I'm not from Washington, D.C. I'm from little Washington. Now, I'm not joking with you. That's how, you know, that's how we, that's how we refer to it down there. But I went down and preached a sermon, and I'm telling you, this little old lady, she was saying, and she got her hanky out, and I started preaching the blood. She started doing, and she just sat there, stood up and just sat there. And there was, a, there was another man, he's right across, about back here. And he sat there like this the whole service. I mean, old, two days older than dirt, had to be. He sat like this. <laughs> and the more she waved and the more he patted, the faster I went. <laughs> Praise God. We had us a sign. We had us a time. Glory to God. God's provision for your health was made at the cross when he made provision for your sin. And so tonight, I want you to have a revelation that Jesus is your healer. How many of you ever heard of the four square churches? Jesus is your savior. Jesus is your baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Jesus is your healer. And Jesus is your soon returning king. That's where the four squares came from. Those four, those four statements became the four, became the four pillars of their faith, the four square gospel. Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Healer, Jesus the uh, Baptized in the Holy Ghost, and Jesus the soon coming King is where they kind of, that's where their name came from. And he's all those things to us. He's our Savior. He is our Healer. He's our Baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And he is soon returning. Amen? Glory to God. Well.